conditioning inside. Let's turn to number 245 and sing about Jesus, more about Jesus I would know. We sing all four stanzas. children now number 579 tis love that makes us happy 579 
Welcome. Good morning. Glad you're all here with us today. Hope you're enjoying this weather as much as I am. So as you know, today is fifth Sabbath. It's typically our take somebody home for lunch Sabbath instead of a fellowship dinner. But if you're visiting today and you don't have plans, we have provided or planned for a small group for the speaker because it was kind of out of sequence with what we normally do. So we're not having a general potluck. If, if you plan to take somebody home, go ahead and do that. But if um, you are visiting and would like to stay, we will have something, um, a meal. We'd love to have you stay with us in fellowship. Hopefully you got the bulletin and there are some announcements. I'm not going to go through all of the announcements today. But if you were planning on singing at Britton Woods, if you typically go, they change that till today. So they'll be going at 2.30 this afternoon if you'd like to go and sing. Also, the church directory is going to be updated. So if you have an updated phone number, email address, something you want to get in the directory for this next printing, make sure you get your information to Gail so she can get it in there uh, for this new, the new directory. That being said, today is the last Sabbath of the last two officer year, two years of officers. So if, you're, if you've been recently elected into a new position, for the next year or two. Um, that starts next Sabbath. So if you have any questions about your position, anything that you're not sure about, please see me. We can review it. I'll try to calm your nerves. Um, it's OK. It'll be fine. But we appreciate everybody who's taken a position, and we look forward to um, your serving this next two years. I don't have any additional announcements, but make sure you do take a bulletin, because there are a lot of them in there. I'll let you read them at your leisure. Our call to worship today is a very, very popular verse taken from Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, one that we should all memorize and, uh, and remember. And it says, God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us.
us pray. Our loving Father, holy is thy name. How great thou art. It is truly a blessing to be here in your sanctuary today to declare your greatness. Oh, our Father, may you be honored this day. May we uplift Christ and humble ourselves. May we draw closer unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn today will be hymn number 33, hymn number 33. be seated. It's time for our children's story, but just before that, we'd like to pick up a children's offering. So if we can get some help in the back, grab a basket with a children's offering, and then Curtis will have a story for us.
Well, uh, this is a rather y young class, I'm, which I'm, f I'm not used to teaching little kids that long about nature stories. So I, I hope they don't get too bored, but I think this will may appeal more to the older class members which, which are here. I'll get this out early so the kids can play with it. Are, are, it's just a cold-blooded animal, so I got to have it in, in a towel. So wh what I'm going to be talking about today is an iguana. If you don't know what an iguana is, this is what an iguana looks like. And actually, like I said, we could, we could pretend this is Ta Taylorsville Biological Field Station right now. And uh, welcome to Biology 324, Herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Iggy, as I call him, because the, that's for iguana. Uh, for those of you who are uh, new to the area, well, I, I keep the wrong glasses. For those who aren't sure what you signed up for for herpetology, it's a study of amphibians and reptiles. So welcome to Biology 324, herpetology, and at least all of it's showing up up there. It's be kind of being cut off back, back there. We're going to be studying about green iguanas, and green iguanas are called green iguanas because they're green. <laughs> so uh, where do they live? Where would you think something like that would live? Well, here's a map that shows you right here. This is the natural range of iguanas. This is where this particular ordinarily lives. It lives in Central America and down to uh, Brazil. But lizard lovers have uh, introduced them. They, 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 they love them so much. Boy, I got the wrong glasses. Please excuse me if I've got to turn around here and, and read my own printing. I haven't memorized it. But they've introduced them to Grand Cayman Islands, Puerto Rico, Texas, Florida, Hawaii, Virgin Islands, Anguilla, Martinique. Uh, and when I say introduced, how did they get there? Well, when they were visiting in Central and South America, they said, oh, these are really cool little critters. I'm going to hide them in the luggage and take them home. So uh, there, there is one, I don't know how they got to Fiji. There must have been somebody from Fiji visiting Central and South America that thought they were cool and took some home to Fiji as well. But this is where they all uh, live right, right now. Uh, I'm going to be concentrating up about today about uh, what's going on with Florida and iguanas because there's a lot of iguanas in Florida that didn't used to be there but it's really kind of uh, interesting how that that works they're actually brought there by, by the pet trade um, but, you know you can you can buy them in pet stores they got hijacked from Central and South America taken to pet stores in Florida and now they're all over the place in Flor Florida so so you know wh where can you see one well, again, I just can't read that back there. I'm, I apologize. Uh, they're quite popular in Florida. Pet stores have them. It's quite lucrative, too. You can go to pet stores and buy these iguanas. Um, but they're, they're brought by breeders uh, who sell them for handsome profit. And these iguanas come in, in five different sizes. Well, they actually grow up. I'm going to be talking about five different stages of the development. Uh, oops. Right, right there. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, this is what a, a newborn or a new hatched, newly hatched iguana looks like. They hatch out of eggs. This is one thing which some people don't don't realize. There's mammals are really about the which is includes people and lions and tigers and things like like that. They are the only only creatures which are born live. Practically all the other animals are laid as eggs. The eggs have to develop, and the eggs have to hatch. So this is a little bit different than what you're used to seeing uh, as far as, as, as that, that goes. Over there on the bottom right is, is a baby. This is a pet, tor pet store size iguana. It's about a foot long when they start selling them. There's about, they're, they're, they're about half tail and half body, so that's about six inches of body and six inches of, 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 of tail. And then, then they start to grow up. This is kind of a, a medium. Uh, uh, this is a kid, kid size, a kid, kid iguana, just, just, just growing up. 
I happen to have one which I brought down, brought down there. Uh, for, f uh, I decided to call him Iggy, Iggy for iguana. So what, what else would you call him like that? Um, but they're, they're about half tail and, and half body. And, when they, and the, the one hit, that's about two feet long, just about that size right, right, right there. But uh, the, the teen size iguanas get a little bit bigger. They're about four feet long, two feet of body, two feet of tail. But the full-size iguanas look like this. They're six feet long. Their bodies are this long, and their tail is this long. And they're running around free in Florida. Uh, so there's one other thing which is kind of interesting. I, I can't use this. If you look under their, their chin, there's a piece of flappy skin down there, which for reasons I have no idea, it's called a dewlap. And uh, I've seen a few seniors as, as well, which is working on, on a dewlap right, right, right here. But uh, they, they have their dewlap from the day they're born till the day they die. You have to, have to be a mature individual with, with lots of experience, as far as humans go, to have, have your own, own dewlap down here. Uh, they're, they're actually, uh, well, out in nature, while iguanas are green, it's kind of interesting that they found a number of, of mutations of this particular I I iguana. Uh, you, you can see up there, you know, or, ordinarily these would be like sitting ducks. Uh, predators would see them and, and gobble them up, but right, right now, like I said, they're, they're finding these things, putting them in, in pet stores. And you can see they've got red ones, they got golden colored ones, they got white ones, they got even turquoise ones. Uh, uh, but you know, so owners of these iguanas can now kind of uh, coordinate their wardrobes with, with their pet, uh, pet iguanas. So they can have uh, appropriate accessories if the case, in case they want to take these things around. Uh, and they're re fairly reasonable. Uh, the normal iguanas go to pet stores anywhere from you know, 15 to $25. Down in Florida, you can buy yourself an iguana. These rare colored ones, a little bit more expensive. The red ones sell for four to five hundred dollars. The albinos for three thousand to four thousand dollars. These, the, those turquoise ones, which I think is hundred dollars. Where do people get money to buy these things? Why are they buying them? People buy expensive cars. You can buy expensive igu iguanas. <laughs> and the winner down there is that white one. Ten thousand and up is what you'd have to pay to get one of those white albino I I iguanas. But you know, uh, uh, enough about that. You know, what, what do iguanas do all day? If you were an iguana, what would, what would you do all, all day? Well, if you let them outside, they'll run around in the grass in the front yard. This is obviously one of the smaller iguanas, which is, which is, which is doing, doing this. Uh, but they also use their claws to climb fences, to climb houses, to climb uh, garages, and they like to sunbathe on the roofs of houses and garages. Well, if you're an iguana in Florida, thousands of miles from where you're born, what else have you got to do with your time except get, a, get work on your tan? Uh, they also climb trees. There's a there's a little one, and there's a middle-sized one, and there's an adult one. You know, running around in trees as as, as well. So. Which, which, is, which is kind of, a, of interesting, you know, but you're, not, you're never going to see them in water. Unlike marine iguanas that, that go fishing, you know, you're not going to find them in the water. Look at this guy. These marine iguanas are really ugly looking things. But uh, what do iguanas hunt for? That's what they hunt for. Actually, this is a critter that Adventists can love. In the wild, iguanas eat leaves, flowers, and some fruits. A nice vegetarian diet, if you please. And if you happen to have an iguana, there's a whole website, petiguanacare.org rec recommends. Here's, here's a list of things that they recommend for iguanas to eat. Uh, if you want to get yourself an iguana, I'll gladly send this to you. Just uh, I can e email it to you. There's a list of fresh green vegetables, frozen vegetables if you can't get the fresh ones, because the iguanas like, like the fresh vegetables and fresh fruit. And there's also fruit, you know, can be added uh, for a variety as well. I'm not going to leave that up there because I don't, don't expect you to read it. But one, uh, one thing which is kind of interesting, which ties into the last slide or two, is iguanas are poikilotherms. Without looking at the screen, does anybody know what a poikilotherm is? 
This is a fan. Oh, I'm a biologist. I'm going to teach you. Poikilothermia means they are cold blooded. It's really kind of interesting. Almost all the animals on the face of the planet, with one exception, with, with two exceptions, are cold blooded. They, they, have, they live in areas which are warm to keep their bodies warm. If they live in areas which are cold, their bodies are, are going to get cold, which doesn't work out too terribly well. There's only two groups of animals which happen to be warm-blooded, and that is going to be birds and mammals. We keep ourselves warm. So that, that's, that's something to keep in, in, in mind. But so one thing to keep in mind is if you get a pet, you want to keep your eye on the thermometer. Uh, in, in Florida, a few years ago, there was a cold snap. And all the iguanas fell off the roofs, fell out of the trees because they, 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 they were cold. It puts them to sleep when, when, when they're cold. And there's a guy looked out his back window of his house, and there's, there's one you know, laying on, up beside the pool, and a couple out, out in, in the leaves that are just kind of laying there. Uh, interesting article in the paper here. Chilled iguanas falling from trees during Florida cold snap. It's raining iguanas. So cold, iguanas were falling from their perches in the, in the suburban trees. Temperatures dipped to 40 degrees in parts of South, South Florida. So, you know, this is not necessarily a good place around here to have an iguana unless you're going to keep it inside during, during the winter. So, yeah, I thought this was you know, kind, kind of interesting. I, I, I do have a, a short little video which. Uh, Hopefully by now should be queued up for you to look at. It tells a little bit more about iguanas. Iguanas are types of lizards. There's a huge family of, of lizards out there that are known as iguanas. There's desert iguanas in the American Southwest. There's the Galapagos iguanas out over the, on those islands. And then there's the common green iguana that many of you have encountered before in your lives. Anybody who's taken a trip to Central South America or even some of the islands in the Caribbean, you've been introduced by green iguanas. Anybody living in Florida certainly knows about green iguanas because they've been let loose in Florida in massive numbers and they now have procreated and inhabit almost every corner of that state. Green iguanas are really a magnificent creature that are arboreal in nature, meaning they love to be in the trees. And a green iguana who's up really high, looking down on you is a calm, easygoing creature. A green iguana on the ground, however, is a different story. Green iguanas feel trapped when they look up at someone approaching them. And they have a bunch of weapons that makes them a formidable animal to deal with. Number one, when they get upset, they whack their tail like that. Thank you very much, it's right on cue. Whack their tail. If you come close to them, they'll bite and defend themselves. And if they can't do that, they'll try to rip you with their hind legs, like so. They have formidable claws, and they're extremely powerful. So green iguanas are abundant throughout their, their terrain. People in Central America actually use iguanas as food. They call them chicken of the forest. They're apparently quite tasty. I wouldn't know. But green iguanas are plentiful. That giant dewlap there, that big piece of skin protruding from the bottom, tells me that you have a small male here. That's just like our anole friends. Iguanas use that dewlap to show that they are the biggest iguana in the area or to show a mate how colorful they are. They'll stay green until about seven years old. Then the males, which will have giant crests on their back, turn a beautiful orangey color, and that's when they become a mature iguana. So iguanas are plentiful. There's many different species. Another is the rock iguana that you'll see throughout the Caribbean islands, Jamaica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic. It's a heavy-bodied animal, usually very dark in color. They're close cousins, but the green iguana is the one most people are familiar with. Isn't that right? So that's just another creature that, that, that God made that you maybe didn't really think about that much more. But if you, if you really want to get it up close, just take a vacation to Florida. You'll probably see them all, all over the place. Okay, that, that, that's, that's it. So thank you very much. time for our offering. Today's offering is for Chesapeake Evangelism. And you might ask yourself, what does that mean? 
what is Chesapeake evangelism supposed to do? Well, there's a story about a, a bodybuilder named Tony, heard about some evangelistic meetings, got interested, decided to go, started attending every night, started telling his friends about what he was learning. At the end of the meetings, he decided to be baptized. That's what evangelism is all about. You know, you hear the stories and say, well, how does that affect me? What can we do? Well, we can certainly give. We can also pray. And for Chesapeake evangelism, it's evangelism that goes on in, in our area. So those kind of stories can be told about people that we know or we live by. So if the deacons come forward, I'd like to ask a blessing on this offering. And think about that as you plan your giving. And throughout the week, talk to your neighbors, pray for your neighbors, people you work with. That's the, that's the way we can spread the gospel is letting them know that Jesus is there and loves them. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us a part in your work. We ask you to bless this offering in a special way as we reach out to those around us in the Chesapeake area. We pray that you'll guide us in all that we do, in our interactions with others. We will witness for you in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Time for our prayer requests, praises. I don't want to monopolize this, but I do have to ask you a question. Do you think God cares about trash? I don't see too many heads shaking. What's the first thought when you think about that? Does God care about our trash? God cares about everything. I've, got to, I've just got to I just share a story with you. It's, it's kind of a trashy story, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. I had, we had a bunch of branches. I had a haul to the dump. I had my trailer full of branches. I'd been collecting some scrap metal I wanted to recycle. I thought, well, I'll just take it all at the same time. So most of my metal I put in the back of my vehicle, and the, I put a couple things in the trailer that I didn't want to put in the vehicle. I got up to the dump, and the, you can unload the greens you know, for free. There's a special area where they put them, and they run all the branches through a big chipper. You know. So I got all my branches drug off. And after all my branches were on the ground, I realized that a piece of metal I had in the trailer was not in the trailer anymore. It got drug off with the branches. And I thought, you know what, that's probably not really good. I don't really want that metal to go through the chipper. So I should find it. So I looked and looked and kept looking. And I just 
drug them off. They were right there. There's, how could I miss this thing? I kept looking. I looked for a long time and I couldn't find it. And I thought, oh, I don't want to be the one responsible. I don't want to read in the paper that their chipper got ruined because some piece of metal went there. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only person that's ever dumped something there that didn't belong there. But still, I felt guilty about it. But I couldn't find it. What am I going to do? So I left, had something else I had to do, but it kept bugging me. So I, after I was done with my other chore, I went back to the dump. And I stopped at the office and I told him what happened. He said, well, I'll, let the, have, I'll tell the loader operator, he'll come over and you can tell him. So I met the loader operator over at the, at the brush pile and he said, well, tell me where it was. I told him, so he got the loader in there and he kind of drug it out. So now not only was my, were my branches not where I put them, they were spread all over the ground. And we were looking, you know, he was in, in the loader moving material and this whole time I'm praying, help me find this piece of metal. You know, and it's not a big deal. It's a little, it's a, you know, some metal steel rod. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. So he finally had to leave. You know, he's like, okay, I've done enough, you know, whatever. He wasn't seemed to be too worried about it. And a couple people there unloading branches, and I'm digging through, and they go, you know, you don't have to dig through that stuff. You know, they'll move it. I said, no, I got it. I know I don't have to dig through it. I'm looking for something. So one guy came over, and he helped me look for a while, and could not find it. Kept looking in the trailer, couldn't find it. Kept praying. And I was, at this time, I'm like pleading with God, you know. And so I said, one more time, I'm going to go back and look one more time. And I looked in some brush where he had drug out my branches with some other stuff. It was mixed in. I looked down. It was right there. Does God care about trash? I was praising God. I found that metal, and I, yeah, I found my metal. And this guy's looking at me like, man, are you crazy? What's going on with you? <laughs> he probably he cares about chippers, but he cares about me, right? Because I was concerned about that, and he, he led me to that. I prayed. But it's just one of those crazy things. You know, you think about God doesn't care about that stupid little stuff. God does care about that stuff. So tell me your stories. What do you want to pray about? Anybody? I'll keep talking if you want. Florence? Uh, Chris is home from the hospital, but she's still not real well. And so we need to pray for her and Don. Okay, Chris and Don are both struggling still. Does she have, is she over the pneumonia or... Well, they let her out, but she doesn't seem very good. She's, um, you know, suffering still. Okay. So remember Chris and Don. I have my phone up here because I was going to read a, I got a text message this morning. Did everybody know that Don Bonchek was sick as well? Yeah. Where is he? Well, I don't know what hospital he's in um, or if he's out yet, but I think he must still be in because the way this was sent to me was kind of a clip from something else. but. And it sounds like Don wrote it the way I, I read this, and I'll, I'll just read it to you. But he said, um, I wanted to update with the good news. I was told the heart converted out of AFib last night about 1 a.m. Praise God. AFib was one of the most scary feelings I have ever gone through. Still more tests, x-rays and needles, hospital food today, so there he is. But it's all good, as I know God has me in his hand. So he's doing better. We keep praying for Don. It was a serious thing. It was pneumonia, and it was septic pneumonia, right? So, I mean, it was pretty serious stuff. So let's keep Don in our prayers as well. And we're glad to see Marshall back, feeling better, I guess. Good. Yes? Thinking of that, I think we should pray for Debbie's parents because she is now on an 11. Yeah, Debbie, we're glad you're here today, Debbie, but we're sorry you don't feel good. And we'll, let's pray for Debbie. Anyone else? I'm sure you all have stories. Kim? Um, I'd like prayer for my friend Gail. We prayed for her in the past. She's been fighting breast cancer for probably 12 years. Wow, okay. And she, is, she went out to Arizona to a health clinic, and she got sick out there, and they had to do surgery on her lungs to remove some fluid. Wow. And she's never, she came out of the surgery, but she's never regained consciousness. And so her family's flying out there today. Okay. All right, let's keep her in our prayers too. Bill. Yeah, my, uh, <clears throat> you know, my dad's been fighting the cancer for four years, and he just got done with radiation on his shoulder. And uh, it was a weird accident. Something fell on him and broke his knuckle, and they wanted to go see an orthopedic surgeon. My dad's just slightly hard headed. for my dad because and then he also switched his medication up because the old medicine wasn't working for the cancer
doctor. So, mm. you know, he, he had to go take a class to learn how to take it. So I don't know. Depending on the side effects, I'm not sure he'll do that either. And okay. So, you know. So Bill's dad. Remember yeah, Bill's dad. I'm, I'm Bill Jr. So it's it's Bill. It's okay. Dad. So that should be easy to remember. Pray for Bill. <laughs> Did I see another hand back there? Oh, Pam. Um, there was a really serious accident down by Liberty Town on Tuesday. A young man, I think from New Windsor, lost his life, and then one of the firefighters from Liberty Town died at the scene. Oh my. Sure. Okay, let's keep them in our prayers. Mike, did you have something? Yeah, just a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Deborah and I will enjoy our 40th wedding anniversary Amen. on July 8th. Amen. Amen. All right. 40th. Okay. <laughs> Joe. Without mentioning names, I'd like to um, ask the Lord to be with a friend of mine who's been unemployed for the past three, four years. And he's getting very, very discouraged, so I'm just uplifting in prayer. Okay. Jacob. Just, um, just a revival in the nation and in the world to just return to our first love in Jesus, each of us individually, any of us who have fallen away from him, and just people to have receptive hearts to, to know that Jesus is Lord and he is coming back. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Carol. Um, I just keep praying for my sister who had hip surgery and uh, subsequently had a, a break in the femur. And it's been six weeks now, and she's finally able to put weight on both feet and get around and do things on her own now. That's why I finally made it here. Okay. <laughs> but I have to go back periodically to help with things. So just to continue to have her heal. Okay, great. Jane? I agree with Jake. Just for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I mean, we just, we need the Lord so bad. And um, when I, I have a really good friend whose husband died this week, um, Myron Widmer. He used to be the associate editor of the Review, so that name might be familiar. Okay. All right. A lot of challenges, things we don't, don't know about. Anyone else before we pray? Okay. Well, let's remember um, Wayne is still having issues and we want to remember Wayne and um, let's keep him in our prayers as well. Let's kneel if we, if we can. Pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for being with us today. We know that you're here. You've told us that you will be in, and we trust uh, your promises. Dear Lord, you know each of these situations. There's so many that were mentioned, and there's so many more that weren't. And we know that you know each situation, and you know the needs at the deepest level. Dear Lord, we pray for healing for each of the situations that were mentioned today. For physical healing, we pray for comfort for those who've lost loved ones, those that are struggling with discouragement. Dear Lord, be with each person in a special way. And dear Lord, we thank you that you care about us, and even the little things in our lives. We thank you that you're a, a huge, awesome God, but at the same time, you're a personal God, one who loves us individually and is our friend. We pray that the world will see their need for you. As we ask that you'll help us to be the lights, be the vessels that you shine through um, to those around us. We each interact with people every day and we have opportunities sometimes we don't realize what opportunities are but we pray that you'll you'll live in us and through us so that others can see you and that they can turn their lives to you and, and be ready for your return to lord please bless our local area our conference as we try to evangelize try to s spread your message in a formal way we pray that you'll be with those plans you'll bless the opportunities that you'll be with people like Tony that find out about those, those uh, evangelistic series and those opportunities, people that are the Lord's working on, that the Spirit's working on their heart. Please reach out to them in a special way and prepare them. Dear Lord, be with us today as we hear your words. We ask that you'll prepare us, you'll send the Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to receive the message you have for us today. We thank you for this beautiful weather. 
We thank you for your love for us and all the ways you show it. And we ask all these things in a special thank you for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be reading from the New International Version. I'll be reading out of Matthew chapter 25, 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be t like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day of the hour. Good morning and happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It's truly a, a special blessing to be here to fellowship with each one of you. Um, I haven't come alone. I brought my family with me, some extended family that live uh, locally, but also my wife and uh, my best friend, companion. Uh, for the past 22 years, since we were teenagers, she was the one that truly led me to Christ and led me to um, this message, honestly. And uh, more importantly, I feel like uh, in a broader sense, I'm with my spiritual family as well. Well, how do I mean that? I don't just mean generically speaking, brothers and sisters in Christ, which we are, but uh, more importantly, Pastor Van Silo was our last pastor in Worcester, Massachusetts, all the way up there, although it is warm up there right now. It's a little bit cooler than it is here, and um, he baptized my oldest daughter, and uh, he was the one that introduced me to uh, the special calling of sharing the word at the pulpit. He opened it up four years ago, and little did I know that that opportunity um, extend to coming down to visit my brothers and sisters here in Maryland. So I just want to uplift the Lord and just say, God is good, and then just uh, hello from your brother from Massachusetts. So I just want to thank uh, our wonderful, uh, I don't know her name, but our wonderful blessing, our person who read our scripture for us today. I'm not going to reread it because I personally believe we should be intimately familiar with that parable. However, I would like to open up setting the scene in which Christ shared those words. You know, it was late Tuesday afternoon. Jesus spent the day in the temple courts. He was repeatedly assailed with tough, or as we would say today, gotcha questions, right? Uh, the religious leaders, they came to him, and they were just trying to catch him and find a way to twist his words. And this account can be found in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, starting in verse 23 through chapter 23 and 39. What's interesting, chapter 23 is considered Christ's last public discourse or teaching. And if you go to verse 16, you'll find at the pinnacle of his point, he pointed out that the leaders of his people, of that religion at that time, were blind guides. They had lost sight of the Father. They had lost sight of the truth, of the origin of the, the message that was entrusted to them and created their own system. And he left the temple court forever. So as Jesus left, he took at least four disciples with them, right, and left, out, left outside of Jerusalem and descended down a steep slope right into the valley of 
Kidron. And then once they traveled through the short valley, they had to ascend the Mount of Olives. Pretty steep climb. In fact, they ascended up to the western slope, and they were 400 feet above the valley. But also in addition, so you think they're on the one side here on the Mount of Olives, you got the valley. But the temple was still about right here, 300 feet below where they were. So if you can imagine the most beautiful panoramic view of the Lord's city and the temple where they just came from, that was the spot. And that was the spot where Christ shared a private discourse or teaching to his disciples to tell them what was to soon happen to this temple, to himself, but more importantly, what would happen at the end of time, what would happen in our time, in our age, just before his return. What's amazing, uh, Mrs. White actually, she set the scene in uh, Christ's Objects Lessons, page 405, as they sat on the western slope, and I'm paraphrasing this, as the sun set, the shadows creeping in, the scene unfolded before their eyes. And the scene she's referring to is of the bridegroom and the, the waiting virgins who are waiting for the, the great wedding, the banquet, right? And it's with this backdrop, Christ spoke to the disciples in Matthew 24 and 25. Now, if you know anything about Matthew 24 and 25, there's a common theme. Because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, you will find in the King James Version um, two words. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Right? Watch. Now, that wasn't just a theme he gave one time. But in fact, to illustrate his point of our need for watchfulness, our need for alert, to be alert, if I could put it blankly, our need for him, the indwelling Christ. He gave six illustrations. The parable of the porter, chapter 24, verse 42. The master of the house, verses 43 and 44. The faithful and unfaithful servants, verses 45 through 51. The ten virgins, which we will look at today, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Of the talents, verses 14 to 30 and the sheeps and the goats, verses 31 through 46. You see, in this point of repetition and coming at different angles, you see, Christ taught in parables a timeless way to teach, that it doesn't matter in what epoch or what age you live. It doesn't matter if you had technology or not. He spoke in simple words that were timeless and were not bound by language. Just as he spoke to the disciples in that day, so too does he speak to us today in clear, clear plain language. As Christians that are expectant of a soon return of Christ, we are called to be vigilant. We are called to the purification of our souls. By what? By donning the robe of Christ's righteousness. Watch, therefore. In addition to donning his robe, he also gives us another special thing. See, the abiding Christ fills us with something different, a love and concern for others, a love that can only come from a selfless God, a love that breaks us, breaks us of self, and gives us new desire, a new passion, a new heart and outlook, that when we look at others, we don't see the outward sinners that we all are. We see a wonderfully made individual that Christ yielded more than I could ever possibly explain. He gave up to save just that one. And so before we begin today, these are questions that I would like you to just reflect upon in this moment. I'm not going to come back to them, but just to set the table for our setting today. Are you ready for the coming of Christ? Are you ready for the expected delay? Are you getting ready on your own? Have you been broken? Have I been broken? Have we been broken by the solid rock that is Christ Jesus? And are you ready to be welcomed at a great banquet and cast crowns at his feet? Before we just get into the parable briefly of the ten virgins, I just would like to share a personal illustration. 
Um, something that I found, I might as well share it with you in the past, I was a soldier. In fact, I had the privilege of being a teacher, well, a drill sergeant. So a teacher with different tools. My wife is a teacher, and um, I, I found through our dialogue and discourse, we had a very similar experience, except my school year was 10 weeks long, and I had a couple different tools that she didn't have, but the concepts were basically the same. And I found the best way to teach was through personal illustration. So I'd just like to share a personal story that will uh, illuminate and highlight the aspects of this parable that we're going to look at today. So as a drill sergeant, can you imagine a teacher, a person who takes civilian and is turn them into soldiers, right? I would probably want to look the part or look like they're trying to become, right? I would probably want to be confident, tall, fit, in shape, have my uniform look good, be able to do anything that I'm asking them to do and in fact show them by example, encourage them to do it, and then follow up and meet them where they are and adapt with them without a moment's notice to try to do whatever it is that they needed to get them to the end result. Well, part of that is personal physical fitness, right? So we had PT tests or physical tests, which consisted of a two mile run, ooh, that's long, um, push ups and sit ups, timed events that honestly, given my body type, it's something I have to prepare for. I have no other way around it. So, in one example, there, I remember one time the test was canceled. Last second, it was canceled. I was like, all right, woohoo. My 100 hour work week, I don't have to stress out about this. I can go about my business giving my, serving my soldiers, right? And there was another time that the test wasn't canceled and I was prepared and I took it, but there was three points of commonality between the time I wasn't ready and the time that I was. In both instances, I had buy-in. I had belief in what I was doing. I knew in order to teach them effectively, I had to be physically fit, and not only physically fit, but I had to be in a condition that I was asking them to aspire to become, right? I also had the desire or the knowledge, I knew how integral or important it was as a soldier to lead by example, to be fit, to endure those 100 hour work weeks, the daily 315 alarm clock that was going off, no matter if I got home at seven o'clock, which was an early day, or 9.30, 10, or midnight. It required a daily commitment. But in both cases, outwardly, you wouldn't have known if I was in shape or not. But what were the differences between the two? The time that the test was canceled, and I, there was a delay, and I became unprepared, and the test came unawares, and then there was the other time that it was canceled, I stayed vigilant, I did what I was supposed to do, what was the difference? On the one hand, I looked like I was ready, but I wasn't eating right, I wasn't working out on my own, getting that extra thing in, because as a teacher, leading them in daily exercise, it wasn't enough for myself. I still had to go and spend time alone, just like Christ taught the masses. He fed them physically, he fed them spiritually, but he still needed to retreat and spend time with his father. I neglected that in my physical life in that example. But in the other hand, there was a time where I did the right thing, I made the right food choices, I did my own work, and what happened on the day of the test? And this is the point of the illustration. On one hand, the delay came, and then the test came. I had fear, I had anxiety, I had worry, panic prayer, and a frantic searching for excuses as to why I was in this situation. And the end result wasn't too good. But then in contrast, when the test came in the time that I was prepared and did the right thing, I had peace. I had an assurance that an assurance and an excitement to go, go ahead and do it and see what the results were because I had confidence. I had the Lord with me and I had prayer. But what was this confidence? It's not in self and it's not the point. The point is this. The confidence that I had was in what was sown. My confidence was in what was invested and I knew in that day the fruit that was going to come forth was going to be a result of what was planted and what was nurtured. Just like as when we Today, as Christians who are waiting for Christ, as we are broken by Him and in an indwelling Christ lives in us, as we die daily, we can also have confidence in that risen Christ in us. So to our parable. 
So Christ was with his disciples on the hill. And what unfolded before them was a gathering, a great soon-to-be celebration, a wedding. And there were ten virgins or maidens. And those ten virgins represented those of us at the end of time that are of pure faith, that faith that's talked about in Revelation 14, 3. They all believe in the soon return of Christ. You know, can you imagine as the disciples looked at them, they would have seen ten women, correct? They would have all looked the same. They would have been dressed similarly, they all had lamps, and they were all admitting the light, and they were all waiting for whom? The bridegroom. And they all fell asleep, but outwardly it all looked the same, just like us today in this church. You know, as remnant believers, we're here worshiping the Lord on his day. We follow the rules, so to speak, keep the Sabbath, teach and love prophecy. I'm a history major. I love prophecy. Prophecy led me to Christ, which is the source of my life and our lives and the source of all. You know, we look the part or people of the book that declare the three angels' messages, right? But there's been a delay and there's a distinction. More, more on that to follow. Now, how about the lamps? So if we think about these lamps, they would have been small um, oil-filled bowls on staffs with wicks for trimming. That way you can control the amount of light that is shown, practically speaking. But in terms of representation, if you go to Psalms 119, 105, what does the lamp represent? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It represents the, Lord of, the word of God. In a literal sense, all ten maidens... They were familiar with their lamps. They understood the basic functionality. They probably used it every day of their lives. They understood no oil, no light. They all had light. They all knew how to use their lamps. How do I know they knew how to use their lamps? Well, when midnight came, they all trimmed their lamps to increase that light, correct? Because typically speaking, midnight is, can be the darkest period of night. But there was a distinction between the two. But where is the similarity for us as those who are expecting the soon return of Christ? We know our Bibles. We have a familiarity with the gospel. We know it can change our lives. We know the purpose of it, and we have it right here. More on that to follow. Now, what about this oil? The oil is very important, and it really ties into... Some of the themes I heard come out in the Sabbath school this morning. We need more of God's abiding spirit. We need more of Christ and him crucified. For Christ in you, the hope and glory. When I am weak, I am strong through him. You see, the oil represents the spirit of God that will fill us. And if you're interested, if you want to you know, just do a little digging on it on your own, you can go to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, and there it beautifully articulates the connections in the, symbi in the symbiology used to the connection between the oil and the living spirit. And then if you really want to itch at it, you can go to Revelation and look, how, look before the throne of God with the two lampstands. Now, I'd just like to point out these lamps. These lamps had little side receptacles or pots that were used as a reserve supply. You see, when we're broken and Christ fills us, just as he spoke to the woman at the well, he fills us, but to overflowing. And in fact, he doesn't just fill us to the top, he fills us so completely that it cannot help but just gush out. There was a distinction between five and five of those maidens, the ten. They all had lamps. They all had oil. They all had light. Just like today, we have the word. We like to come to church. We love the message of Christ. We believe and we want to get to know him. But there is a distinction, but outwardly we can't see the difference. The difference is this. The tarrying came. The waiting came. They all fell asleep. And we're in that period right now. But there's a difference. Time, now is time to awake and choose. You see, the difference between the foolish and the wise, the foolish, they did the works on their own. They were not hypocrites, 
but unwilling to let go of something, whatever it might be, and truly let Christ do the works. In a similar way to the blind guides that Christ had called the Pharisees earlier that day, Jesus also talks about the condition of his church at the end of time, at the toenails of Bible prophecy in which we live today. It's very clear in the book of Revelation. What, how, do, how are we described? As rich, increased with goods, in need of nothing, having all the knowledge in the world, but in fact, what we truly need is more of Christ. What we need is that bomb, the eye solve, to open our eyes and to truly to be able to see ourselves how we truly are, how I truly am, how filthy and unworthy and unrighteous I truly am, our complete, the sinner's complete, my complete need of a risen Savior. And only Him is the rock. Only He can be the foundation upon which we build our lives, our hope, and our faith. It's Jesus Christ. Because truly, I am wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, just as those foolish virgins were. But Christ today is calling us to an awareness of that, to be like the faithful, like the wise virgins, to be broken by the solid rock, to reflect his character, not our own. But how do we do this? You see, it's fine and dandy to hear it, to give it all to Christ, and to be broken. And I would like to, Lord willingly, in the next few minutes, just to give you the how-to. You see, today we live in a day of a lot of distractions. And I'm not talking about the distractions you see politically. I'm not talking about the distractions you see in the world or, or potential economic uncertainty in the future. What I'm talking about, more importantly, as a group of believers who are anticipating Christ coming soon, there is a lot of division in our church. There, there are different things or controversies or doctrines that are pulling us here or there, whatever it may be. And I know you are aware of it, and I don't need to pontificate about one or the other. The point is, to where should our eyes, to whom should our focus be? For if our eyes are not output on Christ, where else can we go? You see, Peter walked on water, but as soon as he looked away from Christ, he began to sink. Brothers and sisters, today is a call for righteousness by faith, or as Ellen White put it, right doing by faith. But how do you do this? Well, it's simple. For Christ spoke plainly. Number one, in Romans 3.10, it says, There is none righteous, not one, not a pastor, not a speaker, not a great evangelist, not the great missionary, not the great medical missionary, not the great Christian, the, that bedrock rock Christian you know, not Paul, not the disciples, none. There are none righteous, not one. Not me. We need that awareness. Christ needs to show us our utter need for him. But even beyond that, if you look at the book of Isaiah, chapter uh, 64, verse 6, it also says, but we, speaking about our right doing, our righteousness, right? Because some of us do great deeds. Some of us do great things for Christ of what we think are good intentions. But we are all as an unclean thing. And how much? All our righteousness are as filthy rags. And the verse continues and says, and we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You see, the reality is this. Even in our good works, we are unworthy. We are called to be broken. We are called to depend completely on Christ. But what hope do we have? And that's the point that I want to leave to you. If there's nothing else you remember today, I just want to point you to this hope. And we just have four more verses to go. Please open to the book of Romans, chapter 3. If you go to the book of Romans, we're going to go to chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. I'll be reading from the King James Version, and the word of the Lord says this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation or satisfaction, appeasement, 
I'm going to focus on that word in a second. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in what? And his blood, to declare his righteousness for the forgiveness or remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Brothers and sisters, propitiation is clearly this. Jesus stands in my place before the law. When I fail, when I have failed, when I will fail, he has already taken it upon himself and became my sin on Calvary. But even more than me, he's done it for all of you too. You see, the point is, we need to recognize how unrighteous we truly are. We have to recognize our utter need for a daily dying of self, to be crucified daily, for there is no good works that we can do. We need Christ and him crucified to live in us. We need to think and ponder on Calvary daily. What did he give? He gave eternity. He substituted his divinity, his righteousness, his eternity, his life, and died the death we deserve we deserve. But because of what he gave, because he, stand, he stood in our place and stands before the Father and says, no, Lord, it's me. It's my blood. I cover them. And he gives us our robe if we're willing to take it. Now, I did mention every time we fail and every time we will fail in the future because we are sinners and we are on a path toward him. But I want to just leave you with a thought, a pattern. Christ gave us a pattern to show us the lives that we can live. He came completely as a human and put aside, laid aside his divinity. His divinity was cloaked in humanity, and he had no advantage or no privilege that we do not have access to himself. Please turn to the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5. We have three verses in the book of John we're going to go to quickly. Just give me a couple more minutes, brothers and sisters, and I promise you we'll be off to our fellowship dinners and our wonderful time there. But before we have our physical healing, we just need a just last piece of spiritual dessert. Right here in the book of John, chapter 15, we're just going to hop over to verse 5. And I still am trying to figure out how speakers are able to navigate their Bibles and speak at the same time, because I honestly struggle. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye, or you all, can do nothing. You see, clearly speaking, if you think, is anyone are, are you familiar with or have ever seen two different plants and how you can literally graft in a branch of a different species into another? And over time, it's coming from the same source, the same supplies, the same nutrients, and they really become one new thing. When Christ was here on earth, the Father abided in him. The Father did the works. The Father gave him the part. He depended completely and only on the Father to do all of it, just as we are to depend on Christ. It is not I that does the works. It's not I that speak. It's Christ. It's not I that loves. It's Christ. We need to, one, recognize our need for him, invite him in, and it's Christ that does it for us. He gave us the pattern on earth. Turn to John, chapter 5, verse 30, just, uh, just a couple chapters over here, just to illustrate this point. John, chapter 5, verse 30. John 5, 30 says this, Christ said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, here's the pattern, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. When Christ struggled, when he was at the point of dying in the garden of Gethsemane, before he even approached Calvary, Lord, if possible, Father, not my will, but thy will. Please take this cup, but not my will. That's our pattern. It's not our will. It's the, it's the will of God. It's the power of Christ in us. And Christ did not die just to pay for our sins. He died and ascended to power and glory is at the right hand of the Father to infuse you as a, as a vine grafted into the, to the overall branch, to infuse you with power to be as Christ was, as Christ is, is our calling to be filled with him. And lastly, turn to John chapter 14. I'm going jumping forward again. Chapter 14, verse 10. 
And Christ said this. After Philip had asked him to show him the Father, Christ plainly answered this. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Brothers and sister, Christ in you, the hope of glory, isn't just a Bible verse. It's the pattern for life. You see, Christ emphasized over and over and over again in his last private teaching, watch therefore, watch and pray. Just as they were utterly dependent on him, just as Christ was completely dependent upon the Father, we too need to be broken of self and to be made new on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. We need an understanding and awareness of our true condition, our true wretchedness, our true filthiness in the sight of the Lord and our utter need for the cloak of Christ's righteousness, his road. Jesus abides in us via the Spirit. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the pattern of Christ's life and the victory that he gained on Calvary. That is the pattern for us to be devoid of self, to live the life that he can impart to us from the inside. Life that it gives us for, life that sustains us today, but the life that gives us the hope and look for eternity. For Christ truly stands at the doors of our hearts and knocks. And if anyone hears and invites him in, he will sup with you, he will dine with you, he will live in you, he will empower you, he will change you, he will transform you. For by beholding, we become changed. And when you fall, get up, continue towards Christ. And again, when you go forward and fall short again, don't dwell on it. Get up and look at Christ. And then as you repeatedly struggle and you have issues, brothers and sisters, all are unrighteous. We have all fallen short. What I'm asking you today is be broken daily, to sacrifice yourself daily, to get up and continue to keep your eyes on Christ, the hope of glory. Christ is coming soon. And it does not matter literally when it is. He's coming soon. Our last day could be today. We're not promised tomorrow. He's begging and pleading to fill you. He already carried the burden for you. He already paid the price. And he's pleading with you, please, stop hurting yourselves. Stop allowing yourselves to be miserable and to make the same mistakes, to keep falling down to the blame yourself, to listening to the devil. I have already borne it for you. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Trust in me. I'm knocking at the door. I'm crying. Brothers and sisters, I just ask to awake today and choose. Choose Christ, for he's calling for a people to give the loud cry. And uh, waiting for a Sunday law or some prophetic event to come in isn't the time to choose. Now's the time to be broken by Christ and to invite him in. Our closing hymn today will be hymn number 207, May It Be Mourn, 207.
Almighty Father, the great I am, I lift my voice up to you in praise and just amazement, the unchangeable one. Before you, your people, we stand. Acknowledge our need for a Savior, our need for a Redeemer. We are unrighteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But, oh, my Father, you have sent us an answer. You have given us your Son. And when you look at us, you look with love, not at where we are, not at our filth, but at what we can be through an abiding Christ in us. O oh Lord, I'll pour your spirit. Fill us to overflowing. Clothe us in the righteousness of your Son. And from this day forward, may today be the first day of eternity. And may we go out doing your will and dying to self. May Christ abide in each hearer's heart, starting with my own, in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.